Ben's been on. We'll return for the final panel of this hearing in a moment, but first, here's an update on what's coming up on C-SPAN 2. Friday morning, a Senate hearing on the U.S. role in Haiti and how much the operation cost. Today, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee heard from Deputy Secretary of State Strobe Talbot and John Deutsch, Deputy Defense Secretary. U.S. policy toward Haiti. Friday morning at 5.30 Eastern, 2.30 Pacific Time on C-SPAN 2. C-SPAN 2, a public service created by companies. Here's a look at our programming schedule. All listed times are Eastern. In a moment, we'll return to the hearing on the nation's drug control policy. After the hearing, see Senate debate on an amendment that would reverse the president's executive order concerning striker replacement workers. Then the South African ambassador to the U.S. talks about changes in his country, followed by testimony on term limits legislation before the House Rules Committee. And that's what's coming up on C-SPAN 2. Next, the hearing on national drug control policy continues. Witnesses during this panel include representatives from national and community anti-drug organizations. This portion of the hearing runs about 90 minutes. I'd like to uh, thank the final panel for your uh, patience and your uh, vigilance in waiting uh, for so long. But I think you, you'll agree that uh, we've uh, uncovered and, and working on a very important subject. Uh, the, uh, we started out at 10.30 this morning and uh, we still have more to go and your part is of vital importance as well. Um, I'm going to introduce the whole panel and then I'm going to ask uh, Admiral Yost if he would go first. Uh, he has a another commitment, and we could ask some questions of him, and then we'll have the questioning of the whole panel after that. Is that nonprofit management experience to include uh, program director Charles Stewart, Mott Foundation. Mrs. Ryan is currently the executive director of the Best Foundation for a Drug Free Tomorrow. We heard a little bit about you from Mrs. Reagan. She's very proud of what the, the excellent job that you do. Good to have you here. And Mr. James Koppel. Mr. Koppel is the National Director of the Newly Organized Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America, CADC. Mr. Koppel comes to this position with an extensive background in community organizing and education. Mr. Koppel is a Ph.D. candidate in the History and Philosophy of Education at the University of Kansas, holds master's degrees from Boston College and Johns Hopkins. Welcome. Mr. Charles Robert Hurd III is the Director of Program Services, Texans War on Drugs. As a young man, Mr. Hurd became involved with prevention programs as a national trainer and speaker with the Mrs. Reagan's Just Say No Foundation. We are proud to have you here with us as well and look forward to working with you. And last but not least, certainly, Admiral Paul Yost. I uh, had a chance to meet with him on several occasions and very proud and honored that you could join us. The former 18th Commandant of the U.S. Coast Guard appointed to that position on May 30th, 1986. Currently he serves as President of the James Madison Memorial Fellowship Foundation. We're pleased to have a person of your distinguished services with us here today. We look forward to your testimony as well. If you would all be willing to stand and be sworn in. Do you solemnly swear that testimony you are shortly to give to this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to start out with uh, Admiral Yost. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Chairman Zeloff and members of the committee. This is my first appearance on national security matters before the Congress since I retired as the Commandant of the Coast Guard in May of 1990. I am pleased to comment on your review of the drug interdiction program. It was nice to see some old friends here, such as Congressman Gilman, uh, Congressman Micah, Congressman Taylor, uh, Congressman Klinger, uh, Congressman Wise, Congressman Slaughter, as well as yourself, Mr. Chairman. I speak only as a private citizen. Our drug strategy has three prongs. Demand, uh, demand reduction, which is focused on treatment programs, source country programs, and interdiction. I will speak only on interdiction. 
I will now summarize the uh, next part of my testimony and will not cover the major buildup in drug interdiction in the at sea uh, war on drugs from 1984 through 1990, but ask that it be included in the record. Uh, this testimony uh, that I'm asking to be included in the, in the record will Without explain, objection. Will explain uh, how Dr. <laughs> will explain Dr. Uh, Brown's statement that 70 percent of the drug traffic now goes through the land bridge with Mexico. That wasn't always uh, true, and I'll talk a little bit about that. By the time I retired as Commandant in 1990, we had successfully interrupted the flow of bulk marijuana by sea and cocaine by air over the water routes. While one might say, why spend all this money for ships and aircraft and operations center, centers if there's not total elimination of drugs, I believe careful thought will provide a different viewpoint. During the years 1984 through 1990, when we were increasing our pressure on the drug trade, the drug consumption figures in the U.S. were decreasing. Strong interdiction and law enforcement were providing a climate that made it clear to the trafficker that this is wrong and your chances of being intercepted are very high. In any event, under the pressure of the national deficit, some felt that interdiction of drugs was too expensive. Both Congress and the administration shifted funds to other priorities, and even the Coast Guard itself shifted assets from drug interdiction to other programs, resulting in the tragic dismantling of much of the enforcement effort at sea. There are others who can tell you what is left of the Coast Guard's 1988 through 1990 drug-dedicated forces. I think what you will find today that there are several orders of magnitude less effort spent on drug interdiction. Ship days and aircraft hours are drastically reduced. All of the Coast Guard Fal jet aircraft, the Falcons, with the F-16 intercept radars were taken away from interdiction and dedicated to other duties. The three Coast Guard E-2C airborne early warning aircraft have been turned back to the Navy and used for other purposes. The Coast Guard Air, Air Station at St. Augustine, Florida, which was established to support these three multi-million multi dollar aircraft, is now closed. The Coast Guard C-130 airborne early warning aircraft has been turned over to the Air Force, stripped of its equipment, including a dome-mounted radar, and is now used for transportation of cargo. In addition, the new Command Control Communications and Intelligence center has been closed and its duties are performed elsewhere. The result of this, I believe, is predictable. The drug, and the drug industry will be returning to its former routes across the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico for both marijuana and cocaine. This is particularly true if we get an active uh, operation on the Mexican land border. As a result of this less expensive method of transportation, that is over the water, Drugs will be more plentiful and cheaper in the U.S. The fact is, when drug availability is high, drug use is also high. Drug education and treatment are less effective when drugs are plentiful and cheap. With high drug use comes high crime, high dropout rates, and increased treatment costs. In short, you will never stop drug use without a solid interdiction foundation for your education and treatment programs. The solution, it seems to me, is to again emphasize the interdiction prong of the drug strategy. For the Coast Guard, that means additional budget authority, I say additional budget authority in the drug interdiction area, as well as a shift of assets among the Coast Guard's own programs back to where they were in interdiction when I was the Commandant. Now a word about leadership in the drug war. As a nation, we have never lacked for leaders or leadership. What we have lacked is authority to actually direct a multi-agency response. The creation of the drug czar in the late 1980s to replace the leadership of the attorney general in that area was not accompanied by the needed authority. Whether the drug czar is Mr. Bennett, Mr. Martinez, or Dr. Brown, he cannot direct cabinet-level officers 
such as the Secretary of Defense for the De Department of Defense Services, such as the Secretary of Treasury for Customs, such as the Attorney General for DEA and FBI, such as the Secretary of Transportation for the United States Coast Guard. He can't direct those, those cabinet level officers regarding budget allocation, personnel allocation, or force deployments. Without that kind of authority, leadership in the interdiction phase of the drug war is largely ceremonial. Today, leadership in our fight against drugs is similarly hampered by the lack of authority of the drug interdiction coordinator or by any other one agency to set binding multi-agency priorities or to mandate multi-agency operations. Those operations always require allocation of forces and allocation of budget. I have no good solution for this state of affairs. A priority on drug interdiction set by the drug czar would have to be imposed on cabinet departments by the president himself. The interdiction coordinator in the, drug, in the office of the drug czar would have to be strengthened with the authority to lay force requirements on other agency heads for specific field operations and to have the authority to direct both strategy and tactics in the interdiction of drugs coming into the United States. I'm afraid the chances of doing either are small. In truth, our government bureaucracy is not well suited to fighting a drug war. A war requires a theater commander with the ability to set the strategy and tactics for the theater and to direct all theater forces in the execution of the war. It also requires a totally committed Congress and administration. Up to now, we've been unable to select a theater commander and to delegate to him the authority he needs to win. Both congressional and presidential budgets simply have not supported the claim that the nation is at war on drugs. And Mr. Chairman, as an aside, I had the occasion uh, last weekend to review the D-Day operation at Normandy. And I have a picture of, President, of General Eisenhower standing on the deck of that cruiser and being the coordinator of that operation rather than the supreme allied commander. And if he were to say to the Air Force guy, would you like to go in and do some bombing? Would you guys in the Army mind going in over the, over the beach? Uh, shall we do it at Omaha Beach? Or would you guys like to do it at someplace else? Uh, we would have still been uh, trying to get over Omaha Beach if we'd had a coordinator or a, or a czar there rather than a supreme allied commander. So what we're lacking is the authority in somebody to call the shots. Thank you for allowing me to testify in an area where I spent a number of years of my life and I'm still very dedicated. I'd be very happy for questions. Okay. I think in, in view of the, uh, what we'd like to do for those members that are just coming back, um, we're going to allow each member to use five minutes of their testimony in, in terms of asking questions to the witnesses. Uh, because Admiral Yost has to leave, we're going to give those people who want to talk and ask him questions as part of their five minutes, the opportunity to do so. And we'll take turns on each side of the aisle, and then we'll have the other members of the witnesses, uh, the panel, give their testimony, and the balance of the questions will be with them. Who'd like to lead on? I had a couple of, of uh, <clears throat> simplistic uh, questions, possibly. I don't have a background in some of this. You say the Coast Guard has shifted assets from drug interdiction to other programs. Like, what would they have been shifted to? Uh, search and rescue, uh, fisheries enforcement. I can tell you, as the Commandant, I stripped many, many ship days and aircraft hours out of the entire East Coast and moved them down into the Caribbean. And not all the congressmen and senators in those districts and states were delighted to see assets leave New England or the mid-states the, the mid that they thought were there for fisheries, for search and rescue to support their constituents and see them down in the Caribbean. But that's what we did. Those, those forces have now been slid back in to where they were before with a great, uh, with, a, with a tragic, in my view, uh, dismantling of the drug interdiction operation. The F-16 intercept radars, uh, do you know what they're being used for? Or? The F-16 radars are about a $15 million radar. They were put on the Falcon jet aircraft, the Coast Guard jets, uh, for the sole purpose of scrambling on, uh, from a field somewhere in the Caribbean and intercepting 
a drug aircraft that was on the airborne early warning screen of one of the Coast Guard E-2Cs that was sitting there at altitude with a picture of the whole Caribbean. And what are they doing with them now? They're now back in search and rescue, and some of them, I think, are, are being uh, decommissioned. It's a, it's a $15 million radar, a $20 million radar, and a $20 million airplane. Was the uh, station at St. Augustine uh, a critical one for the Caribbean? The, <clears throat> the station at St. Augustine was put into operation while I was commandant for the sole purpose of supporting the three airborne early warning aircraft that the U.S. Coast Guard got from the United States Navy to do the drug war in the Caribbean. Once those aircraft went back to the Navy, the whole, uh, and they're a carrier-based aircraft, the, day, the Navy is using them, I would guess, in support of carrier ops, the air station was closed. It wasn't needed. I also had one other question on the the one that you said was being used for cargo. Did the Air Force have a shortage of cargo planes because there's, they were diverting resources elsewhere? There's always a shortage of heavy lift cargo airplanes. In every contingency plan, there's a shortage. This C-130 was funded by Congress. It was funded uh, as an AEW aircraft, that is an airborne early warning. It was a suite of, uh, of airborne early warning radars went into it, probably a $24 million suite, went into it because it had the staying power to stay on scene for very long periods. Uh, once the, the, the reduction in, in effort was made, that aircraft was stripped of the, of the radar and the equipment and, uh, and uh, was given to the Air Force who wanted it for heavy lift. I think it's uh, tragic that this could have been happening and the groups we're about to hear from are out there trying to fight these battles and are just being overwhelmed because we backed off uh, blocking the supply coming in. I thank you for your testimony. Congressman Wise. I thank the gentleman. Admiral Yost, it's good to see you again, sir. Very nice to Admiral see you. I remember when you rescued me at one of these hearings. If Admiral, it's, that's true. Uh, Admiral Yost <laughs> appeared in front of our subcommittee several times. He made it possible for our subcommittee to go twice uh, to the Upper Walaga Valley when nobody else seemed to be able to find the assets, and we greatly appreciate it. I want to also say that uh, uh, I appreciate your remarks on the drug czar and the problems, my observation has been through, this is the third administration now, that the drug czar has never really found his or her legs, uh, that what you have is a, p a position uh, that's on paper, but you don't have the ability to put into play and to actually do the direct command and control uh, that you would, when you say czar, you think you mean. As I recall, you would fight, you would compete for assets with somebody else who was competing with somebody else. I will say that pound for pound, Mr. Chairman, I found the Coast Guard uh, to be by far the best uh, involved in this. Others would try, uh, but in terms of committing assets and, and being able to supply uh, uh, results, uh, Admiral Yost and the Coast Guard did an incredible job. I, I would like to discuss a little bit about the interdiction part of it, though, uh, the shifting of assets that you, you are concerned about. Uh, it was my observation that uh, we were in a constantly evolving uh, program in interdiction, whether we were talking about um, Operation Snowcap in the Upper Wallaga Valley to then uh, the coca leaf. At first we concentrated on the coca leaf and then we thought, well, that's not, we're not able to get to the peasants and burning it doesn't do very much good. So then we went to the, uh, the first step labs where they would mix the paste. Uh, then we concluded, well, we're still dealing with small traffickers. So over a period of years we kept working this way until eventually we got to Miami. Um, it, it seemed to me, and the chart seemed to indicate it out, that the interdiction, and particularly the interdiction that you were involved in, had a, a period in which it was successful, but then traffickers found other ways, particularly to avoid the Coast Guard. Would you, and, and that, so while we did see the interdiction being successful, amount of drugs, at least as measured by street price, amount of cocaine seemingly dropping on the streets, it picks back up again, uh, as traffickers found other ways to, to get it here. Would you comment on that? I will, and part of that was also our own domestic production of marijuana was a, was a, fa was a factor in this. But uh, as I said, we did interrupt materially the transportation over water, and then they began to take, fly it up through the land bridge over Mexico. <clears throat> so when Dr. Brown says uh, it's now moving most of it over the land bridge in Mexico, I say yes, that's where it's moving because we stopped it or interrupted it over water. And if we if we take away now the interdiction over water and we're not effective in the land bridge, it's going to come back over the water 
because that's far cheaper than going up through the land bridge. Is there not also a concern with the problem with the Coast Guard in that since that time it's also been tasked to handle very significant uh, jobs, particularly dealing with interdiction from Haiti, that is people, uh, one of its traditional functions, interdiction from Cuba, uh, that patrolling that's necessary, and so that some other functions in an, an immediate national security situation, uh, national security um, uh, concerns that have uh, the challenge of Coast Guard, as well as it's, uh, it's run into a few environmental problems recently, too, hasn't it? Yeah, it would only be fair to say, uh, in my answer to the gentleman over here, it's true. Some of those assets also went to the Haitian interdiction, to the Cuban problem, uh, but the assets went to higher priority places in the view of whoever was running the program. Mm -hmm. And so that meant that drug interdiction had to be a lesser priority than Haitian interdiction, Cuban problems, search and rescue, fisheries. Mr. Chairman, I've been told by a stenographer that I talk faster even than Barney Frank, and that's the fastest clock I've seen. Did that really run the five minutes? <laughs> we, uh, you have a 30-second question? The 30-second question is going back to the drug czar. Do you, do you have a specific suggestion then how it is that we could uh, end some of the turf battles and make the drug czar truly a drug czar? I, I don't have problems with the administration's cutting the drug czar based upon what I'd seen of the drug czar's performance in past administrations. Good, so well-meaning people. Dr. Bennett was a well-meaning person, but he couldn't command anything. That's right. I, I, and Dr. Bennett will never forgive me, I suppose, for saying that his position was largely ceremonial. Yes. Uh, but he would also tell you, I'm sure, that he, that he felt it was very much of a bully pulpit, and I think it was. Uh, I don't know how to find somebody and put them in charge. Somebody. I was once sitting in the tank with the Joint Chiefs of Staff when, when Congress was encouraging and the administration was encouraging the Joint Chiefs to get involved in the middle of this drug war, and the Chiefs were very reluctant. And I said, I'm in the middle of it, I'm doing it, and I want to work with you guys, but I really object to you guys getting in it. And the chairman looked at me and he said, Paul, what do you expect us to do? And I said, Admiral, I expect you to be a motor pool. When I want a destroyer, I'll ask for it. When I want an E2C, I'll ask for it. When I want an AWACS, I'll ask for it. I'll want to run the drug war as far as the interdiction goes, and you be the motor pool. And he did just what I would have done. He slammed his fist down the table. He said, Paul, I'm not going to be a motor pool for anybody. And I said, well, I'm not either. And there you've got the same thing between Customs and Coast Guard and DEA and FBI. Nobody wants to be a motor pool. And until somebody says, Admiral Yost, you're in charge, and these guys are going to respond to you, budget, personnel, uh, tactics, strategy, uh, the way they would do to a theater commander. We're never going to have anybody in charge. Yeah, I'd like to see the Commandant of the Coast Guard put in charge of the interdiction war over the water. But he okay. can't handle the land border in Mexico. I don't know who can handle that. Maybe that's an Army job. I don't think we'll ever do it for in source. The in source country program is not getting very far. Thank you, Adam. Mr. Chairman, um, I know that you're going to stay here, but some of us are going to go vote. Admiral, I just want to thank you for being here, and I hope and I just want to ask the chairman if um, we will also be able to uh, have questions submitted Absolutely. and answered for this panel as well. But I'll be back. Will vote. this panel be willing to take questions that we don't have time to answer in a reasonable period of, say, 10 or 15 days, get back to us? We'd appreciate that. Appreciate it. And I, 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 have, say, I have some additional questions, though, the Admiral. Yeah, I, I have a very small staff compared with the 40,000 I had as the Commandant of the Coast Guard, but we'll struggle with it. <laughs> I, uh, I just uh, I, I got a kick out of your last response, and uh, I, I just ask you, uh, Sounds like Wayne Downing's uh, General Downing, four-star General Downing, and the Special Forces operations—the kind of thing we need in the drug war. Is that? Would you yes. comment on that? Love to have General Downing running it. I'd work for it, but uh, I mean, and I don't want to be a motor effort, pool for anybody. Isn't that the kind of effort yes. where you can draw on resources? And when he came to visit this committee, he came in and he had members of each of the services there. But I'm sure that if he gives the order that he needs something, he's got it. Because their bosses have told them. But a cabinet-level officer is probably not going to be told by the drug czar to, to allocate budget and forces. Uh, that's going to have to be done above the cabinet. It's a very strange way we have... The decision have... has to come from the top. And, yes. and obviously the, the commitment's got to start there. Yes. And it's got to be shared by all of us as well to provide yes. the resources. I would like to also mention that uh, the chairman of the Coast Guard Committee, Mr. Howard Coble, couldn't say enough good things about you as well as Admiral Kramick. But, uh, 
particularly wanted me to give you his best regards. Uh, my question is, is, Admiral, you led a successful sea interdiction of arms in Vietnam. Um, it seems like there's a similar problem here. Are there any lessons that we've learned from that experience that we could put into the drug interdiction program? And then secondly, uh, who, in your judgment, would be the best person to lead the, drug war, the war on drugs in the United States now? Yeah. In Vietnam, we had an interdiction problem. We were trying to keep the uh, North, Viet North Vietnamese from smuggling arms across the Vietnamese border to the Viet Cong. I spent over a year in combat uh, doing that job. We had uh, the assets we needed, uh, maybe three or four times the drug interdiction assets we have uh, per mile of coast or, or uh, compared to the problem. We had aircraft, boats, and ships dedicated. We had a dedicated commander. We had a chain of command. We had responsibility and accountability. And when, somebody, and when something got through, there was accountability for it. Uh, it would take a lot more assets than we are putting into drug interdiction now or even that we have in the past. And it would take a chain of command that, that would be responsive in a multi-agency way. Customs, Coast Guard, DEA, FBI, all answering to one person if, uh, in, in the drug interdiction business. Uh, I would, of course, like to see that as the, United, as the Commandant of the United States Coast Guard uh, over water uh, and uh, uh, in, in, in interdiction over water. So Admiral Kramer, Kramick would be the one and give him the resources he needs? Yes, and I think he'll probably never speak to me again because I, I don't know that he wants that job. We'll see that uh, he finds out that you uh, instigated <laughs> this. But Hopefully. my question, I guess, is, is can we really win the war? And we've heard about it all day today. No. Can the war be won? No, we can't win the war. Uh, uh, we can't win the drug interdiction war. What we can do is a is a reasonable job in drug interdiction to provide the foundation for treatment and education and prevention. And without treatment, edu education, prevention, that, that's what will win the war. But just laying those out there without a, a credible interdiction law enforcement program doesn't work. Nobody thinks you're really serious. And it provides the, the supply and the cheapness is there. You, can, you can't win it in that situation. With that, I thank you very much for your testimony. You. We appreciate, I know thank how busy you are, and we appreciate you. your being thank here, you. and we're honored that, uh, that you could be a part of it. Thank I you, I appreciate sir. the rest of the panel letting me go for first. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Thomas Hedrick, Jr., and your son, welcome. Thank you. Would you like to lead off with a testimony? We would. I would like to start off by saying that uh, I think, while we are not, we in the partnership are communications experts and not policy experts, I think take note of what, something that Admiral Yost said, that almost everyone in the interdiction business believes that while they have an important role to play in the overall drug policy, that we cannot interdict our way out of this. And amongst ourselves, I think we, all always, we often give the impression to the public uh, that it's demand reduction or supply reduction, it's treatment or prevention, it's supply or it's demand. And I think we do a disservice to the public and help confuse them when we don't first acknowledge, all of us, no matter which side we're on, that this is really a combination of both and all that we can do to reduce drug use. I'm here primarily because we at the partnership believe that preventing drug use by young people and by all who influence them, importantly, must be the cornerstone of national, state, and local drug strategies and resources if we have a, uh, are to have a prayer to build safe and healthy families and communities. I've dedicated nearly 10 years of my life to help uh, prevent drug use among our youth, and I know that prevention works. I've seen the results both professionally and personally. As Vice Chairman of the Partnership, as a Director of my state and local community anti-drug coalitions, and perhaps most importantly, as a father. But now, quite frankly, I'm frightened because after nearly a decade of progress, Drug use is rapidly increasing, and I believe we, led by you, must act quickly and aggressively if we are to avoid millions more of our young children becoming impaired by and addicted to illegal drugs. To begin to understand this problem and the critical importance of prevention, we must recognize that drug abuse is a process, and that process begins one child at a time making the decision whether or not to use drugs. That decision is occurring millions of times today, tomorrow, next week, 
next month and for the years to come in every city in every town across America. It is most effective and most efficient to prevent this first use by defining any use as abuse. Each stage in the drug abuse process from trial to trouble that you see on the chart to my right <clears throat> becomes more difficult and more expensive if we don't start at the top. The public and often policymakers tend to focus on the addiction end of this process with the nearly six million people in need of treatment. But we must understand, next chart please Steve, that nearly all of these people, nearly all current adult drug users started using drugs as teenagers and very frighteningly more than half started before their 16th birthday. We believe there are three major barriers to providing the leadership and resources necessary to improving the nation's prevention efforts. All barriers are misperceptions by the public. The first is that we have lost the so-called war on drugs. Setting aside the fact that this is an absolutely terrible metaphor, particularly with respect to prevention, three quarters to 80 percent of the public believes that the drug problem has only gotten worse over the past 10 years. They believe that nothing works, and they believe that we are nearly destined to see it get worse in the future. That perception is simply not true, as has been pointed out many times. Half as many people are using drugs today as we're using them in the mid-1980s, and while 12 million Americans using drugs in the past month is still way too many, it is an enormous decrease from its highest level. More progress is possible, and that belief is confirmed by the progress we've already made. We've got to affirm that fact with the public to correct the public's feeling that solving the drug problem is hopeless and that all of us and all of them are helpless to do anything about it. The second major misperception about drug use is that it's primarily a problem of inner city ethnic kids. This is another terrible and perhaps even more terrible stereotype. It has two major negative impacts. First, it makes our inner city children's decision not to use drugs much more difficult because it gives them the impression that all of their peers use drugs. And second, it lets the rest of America off the hook, feeding our denial that drugs are a problem for our children. The facts are quite clear in this regard. 75% of all drug users are white, and for kids in school, whites are significantly more likely to use drugs than are their African American counterparts. Third major area is a lack of understanding that drugs is not just an I issue in and of itself for those using and those addicted, but quite frankly has become severely embedded in the last 30 years in every major social issue we face in this nation. Drug abuse, most of the public understands, is inextricably linked to crime and violence, but it also contributes to the breakdown of our families, the abuse of children and adults, perhaps the great American tragedy, the spread of the AIDS virus, school dropouts and declining quality of education, homelessness, urban decay, high health care costs, and even economic productivity and competitiveness. We have to get the public and, and your uh, peers, quite frankly, to understand the overarching importance of this issue. After nearly a decade of progress, what we face today is a crisis of dramatically increasing use among our youth, not someone else's kids, our youth, every age, every ethnic group from all parts of America. Crisis is not an overly dramatic or inappropriate description, particularly when you consider the drug use among our youngest kids, 13 and 14, has more than doubled in the last three years. Much of this increase, although certainly not all of it, has been driven by marijuana, and we know why this is occurring. Our children now view drug use as less dangerous and with less social approval less social disapproval than they did four or five years ago. Quite frankly, from a marketing point of view, more dramatic attitudinal changes than I have ever seen. There is general agreement that the balance in the information our children receive has been changing. We are not as effectively communicating with our children that drug use, any drug use, is harmful to them, harmful to their development, and harmful to society. We must increase the involvement of parents in setting this clear expectation of no use, particularly since many of us are baby boomer parents and many of us tried drugs and many of us have a conflict about how to talk to our kids and say no when in fact we said yes, an issue we face together. <clears throat> we must increase the involvement in quantity and quality of comprehensive in-school education. I'm not prepared to tell this body how to do that. I just know that in-school education works. 
We must also work to reduce the amount of pro-drug information that our children are exposed to by recognizing the enormous impact that the legalization debate has on our kids and the recent reglamorization of drug use in some of the media. We at the partnership concentrate our efforts primarily on reaching children and parents through the media. Our primary focus is on researching, creating, and airing anti-drug attitude messages to unsell illegal drugs. I think we're known to the layman as the fried egg people. I'll be showing a short tape of some of our most recent television work in a few minutes. We also work with major broadcast and print media to help in the development of their news, editorial, and features about drugs. And we also invest some of our time and resources in working with the entertainment industry, helping to educate them on their influence in our children's decision whether or not to use drugs. The nation's media has donated over $2 billion in time and space to get these anti-drug messages to the public. In 1990 and 91, this translated to about one anti-drug message per household per day. However, support of these messages has declined by nearly 20 percent in the last three years because the media is not as convinced that the drug issue is as important as it was. There's been an even more dramatic decrease in the news coverage of the drug issue, as you can see from this chart, going from about 600 stories in the three major networks in 1989 to 65, which quite frankly from a communications point, ladies and gentlemen, is about zero. And our youth also have an exaggerated idea of drug use among the entertainment professions. And the situation is getting worse. Therefore, we at the partnership are concentrating our efforts to increase positive media communications to children and parents. But federal support and federal leadership in making a drugs a critical national priority is essential if we are to help convince the media that this is an important issue. Quite frankly, when you all in this town talk about drugs, the media believes that drugs are important. When you don't, they don't. The focus of all of our efforts and all of our programs, both private and public, and I think everybody in this panel would agree, must be to affect individual attitudes and individual behavior at the community level. This grassroots community coalition movement is already a surprisingly strong reality with over 3,000 anti-drug community coalitions, a grassroots uh, movement, quite frankly, unlike anything I have seen. What we need to do is to reinforce it and expand it. And we need federal leadership to tell them that what they are doing is important to the nation, perhaps even more importantly than giving money, is telling them that what they're doing is important. And we need to provide the prevention resources they need to get the job done. What can be accomplished through this is evident in hundreds of communities across America and probably in many of your districts. Perhaps most powerful, though, are the results of the Miami Coalition, one of the oldest and best organized coalitions in the nation. Miami has reduced drug use to a level that is less than half the U.S. average and by far the lowest of our major metropolitan areas. Imagine, Congressman, if we were able to duplicate Miami's efforts net across the nation, we would have six and a half million fewer regular drug users, and we would be much better prepared to deal with the upturn in drug usage by our kids. Given the importance of drug use to the nation and the al alarming recent increases in drug use among our youth, it would be both imprudent and, I believe, irresponsible to reduce public or private resources for drug prevention. The evidence is clear that drug use is a preventable behavior. Prevention has worked, is still working where it's aggressively applied, and must be expanded now across America. Drug prevention also, as I said earlier, is absolutely essential to reducing crime and violence, the spread of AIDS, improving our children's education, reducing family abuse and child abuse, reducing our health care costs, reducing homelessness, and improving our economic uh, productivity and competitiveness as a nation. The focus of our prevention efforts must be our children and their attitudes, helping our kids one kid at a time to make better decisions. And we know how to do it. This is not rocket science. The more our kids see drug use as harmful and socially unacceptable, the less likely they are to get involved with drugs. To make that point, my son Todd is here representing our youth. 
but he could just as easily be your son or grandson. At 16, he's 30 years younger than I am. He likes heavy metal music. I like Frank Sinatra. He wears earrings, as you can see. I wear lapel pins. But the biggest difference is that 30 years ago, when I was his age, we had almost no drug use in this country. Today, it is all around him, and in one of the most affluent communities and top public school systems in America. If Todd's on drugs, how am I, as his father, going to be able to teach him that violence is not the way to resolve conflict? If Todd's on drugs, how is he going to make the tough decision about dating in the age of AIDS? And if Todd's on drugs, how does he get himself prepared for tomorrow's workforce and to be a productive and contributing member of society? And unlike you or I, he faces this issue all the time, every day, and the decision about what's best for him. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I'd like to uh, thank the. I'd like to thank uh, you, Mr. Hedrick, for your uh, testimony and uh, also for your work and leadership with the uh, Partnership for a Drug-Free America. And at this time, I uh, recognize uh, your uh, son, Todd, for his comments. Many people believe that it's only in the inner city that drug use is common. I'm here to tell you that that is not true at all. My own town of Greenwich is a very affluent area of Connecticut. And most people are still in denial about a rampant drug problem. The public school system is considered to be one of the finest in the nation, yet our drug use among students in the high school is bad enough to mandate police dogs searching all the lockers. Students are found frequently with drugs in their person during school. For some strange reason, the Board of Education of Greenwich just voted to reduce drug education in the school system. The only explanation is that the parents don't understand who their kids are and what they do. They assume that there can't be a crime and drug problem in such a wealthy town. They assume that the arrests made and incidents that happen are isolated and will never happen to their kids. Several years ago, there was a double suicide where the victims were both using LSD. Their parents were unsuspecting. A few months ago, a house was put under surveillance for drug trafficking, and also the parents were surprised when their child was arrested. These parents need a serious wake-up call. The sad truth is that the parents who are in denial and who make these assumptions are the ones with kids who are already regular users. The parents don't give enough attention to the issue or to the kids, just as the media and school systems don't. Since these three groups are making stupid decisions regarding drugs, the kids do exactly the same. I have spoken up because I realize that no matter how much they study the statistics, adults can't have the first-hand knowledge today of losing friends to addiction and watching drugs, quote, eat the heart out of this country, unquote, which ironically is our president's description of welfare. I remember when I was 12 years old, I knew a hardcore pot user in my school. This instance has multiplied a hundredfold in high school. Every kid in the school knows who deals and uses drugs and where they could go if they needed a fix. This entire country needs a huge turnaround in how it deals with drugs. The fact that drugs aren't a prominent issue anymore tells kids that adults don't care about it. That's suicide to my generation. And we're the ones who'll be running this country pretty soon. As a solution, education must start earlier in elementary school. Parents must talk to their kids about drugs regularly, and the media must give it headlines. And the legalization movement must be put down immediately because it sends kids the message that adults are giving up and that drugs are acceptable. We all have to do our part to save future generations. I will close my part of the testimony with the short take of some of our most recent anti-drug messages for kids and parents. We will work at the partnership to keep these messages coming and to get them aired more often. Our work is necessary, but our work is not sufficient. We also work with and support Lee Brown's efforts. But what America needs is more federal prevention resources and a prevention system that can cost-effectively catalyze prevention programs at the community level, particularly by parents and particularly through comprehensive in-school education. Most importantly, quite frankly, America's youth needs your leadership to clearly set drugs as a priority for us all. And when all the rhetoric is over and this testimony is over today and you go away and think about what should be done and what programs should be supported, I hope you will try to see this issue as my son Todd sees it or as Lee Brown's grandchildren see it or quite frankly as your daughters and sons and grandchildren see it because then you will have the only perspective that really counts. You show the spot.
They say one of the surest ways to get your message across is to put celebrities in your commercial. We hope they're right. When I was high on pot, I was flirting with this guy and I didn't even know who he was. I didn't know his name. And we were we ended up having sex with each other. And I felt like, why am I doing this to myself? And what's going on with me? I felt very ashamed and I felt embarrassed and I felt dirty. Marijuana, it won't get you nowhere. I would do just about anything to get pot. I stole jewelry from my mom, you know, stole her money. I was doing a lot of shoplifting, you know. My mom would just be like, you know, where are you going today? And I would just lie to her, dead in her eye, lie to her face every day. Just came home one day from school, all my bags were packed, and she said, if you keep smoking, you're gone. out of Jefferson Elementary, a confident young man with a great stride, but, uh-oh, he might be in trouble now. Hey, Chris. Wanna get high? No way, man. That stuff's for losers. Oh, what a move! Chris Hill never hesitates, just blows past that guy, Bob. You're right, Mike. Look, Chris is known for his great head shake. Then he shifts his weight to the right foot, finds a hole, and zip, he's out of there. Spectacular, just spectacular. This kid's got a bright future. Yours? No, I'm... Mother said she found it in your closet. I don't know. One of the guys was... Must have what? Look, Dad, it's Where not... did you get it? Dad, Answer I... me. Who taught you how to do this stuff? You, all right? I learned it by watching you. Parents who use drugs have children who use drugs. Statistics show that 40% of all kids who smoke marijuana live in the city. And guess where the other 60% live? My teacher tells us to just say no. Policemen said the same thing. They don't have to walk home through here. Because the dealers are scared of police. But they're not scared of me. And they don't take no for an answer. To Kevin Scott and all the other kids who take the long way home, we hear you. Don't give up. Thank you very much. Mrs. Ryan. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to join in this discussion of drug control strategies and to address whether current prevention efforts can work. These are some of the same issues that the Conrad and Hilton Foundation and its president, Donald Hubbs, pondered during the mid-80s. Hilton approached the Rand Corporation and asked how a private foundation can impact the problem of drug use among youth. 
Rand initiated a broad-ranging inquiry into the three major strategies for curbing drug use in the United States, law enforcement, treatment, and prevention. Their findings led Chief Researcher Dr. Phyllis Ellickson to recommend prevention as the first priority, specifically the development and longitudinal testing of Project Alert, a prevention curriculum for middle school children. Today, Project Alert is a validated program with proven effectiveness. It is based on the simple premise that young people, trying to appear more mature and independent, often start using drugs in response to social influence. Project Alert builds upon three propositions. One, substance abuse prevention programs should target substances that are used first and most widely by young people. Tobacco, alcohol, marijuana, and today, inhalants. Two, drug prevention programs must begin by helping students develop the motivation to resist using drugs. Teaching resistance skills alone is not enough. And three, adolescents are much more likely to absorb new information and learn new skills when they are actively involved in the learning process. How you teach is as important as what you teach. This underscores the need for delivery by an education professional. Hilton challenged Rand to find out if a social influence approach incorporating these principles works across a broad variety of schools and community environments. The resulting drug prevention trial conducted with methodological exactitude remains one of the most rigorous ever undertaken. The research findings disproved the three common criticisms of prevention programs. First, that prevention only works in middle class, largely white suburban situations. Second, that the program works only for the kids who need them least, and finally, that prevention programs prevent only trivial levels of use. Project Alert works well in urban, suburban, and rural areas, in middle and low income communities, and in schools with high and low minority populations. As executive director of the Best Foundation, a nonprofit organization created by the Hilton Foundation to make Project Alert available to schools across America, I am on the front line of the implementation process, not the research process. And every day I combat myths at the delivery level about what works and what doesn't. Prevention can and does work, but our educators and policymakers must be selective in funding and implementing validated programs. It is estimated that more than 2,000 non-validated programs are in use. Clearly, we need to do a better job of technology transfer. We need to make information about valid approaches more widely available and provide incentives for educators to choose programs that have demonstrated results. Substance abuse prevention programs must be specific. Despite the current clamor for generic programs, one size doesn't fit all. Motivating children to avoid drugs is not the same thing as motivating them to avoid violence. And we cannot teach kids to resist pro-drug pressures by teaching them how to cope with anger or frustration. Effective drug prevention programs need to have a specific drug content and need to deal with the specific societal pressures to use that are endemic to drugs. Prevention programs must be ongoing. One intervention experience, even a series of lessons in elementary or junior high school, is not enough. Most programs, including Project Alert, do not provide continued reinforcement during high school. But the pressures to use drugs do not subside as teenagers grow older. Funding to develop and validate high school programs is critical. Education and school-based programs should be at the core of prevention, but there is no substitute for a broader social environment that reinforces these programs. This includes strong leadership, media reinforcement, and parent and community-based programs. One support program that helps young people on a broader scale is the Best Foundation's Nancy Reagan After School Program. This program develops creative, healthy behavior as an alternative to drug use and actively addresses the issues of self-esteem, stress management, skill building, and self-expression. It is a program that works with the whole child and a child that is nurtured and feels safe becomes a teachable child in the classroom. Trying to deliver effective in-school programs without altering the environmental factors that help shape adolescent behavior won't work for many youth. 
In summary, our national policy needs to support a core of validated in-school prevention programs that impact youth throughout their school years. These programs should be supplemented by family and community-based programs that send our children to class ready to learn. Prevention isn't the only answer, but it's an integral part of it. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I would like to submit a supplemental material for the record, uh, the RAND Corporation Research Report, titled Prospects for Preventing Drug Use Among Adolescents, and a brochure titled Project Alert, a Solution from the Best Foundation for a Drug-Free Tomorrow. Without objection. On the remainder of the witnesses, if you uh, feel that it's appropriate, uh, all of your material can be submitted to the record, and if you'd like to just kind of summarize, that would be great. Mr. Koppel. Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the Government Reform and Oversight Committee, my name is Jim Koppel. I am the National Director of Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America. Uh, Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America, or CADCA, was founded in 1992 by President Bush's President's Drug Advisory Council and it was developed to respond to the growing community coalition movement in this country to address the nation's drug crisis. We are privately funded from major grants from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the Knight Foundation, and numerous other private foundations. We are a membership organization with approximately 2,500 <laughs> community coalition members in every state and two territories. I would like to begin my remarks by setting a context for uh, what I would like to say following this little story which is in my written testimony. Uh, several years ago I was leading a local community coalition in Wichita, Kansas called Project Freedom that was jointly funded by the Kansas Health Foundation and the Wichita Public Schools. At that time we developed an interagency task force on gangs and drug related violence and it was my responsibility as director of Project Freedom uh, to help support and fund our local gang unit. I occasionally went out with them. In fact, for a period of eight months, I went out with them every weekend uh, uh, to do street interventions with kids who were involved in gangs. On one particular evening, we were invited to participate in a raid on a crack house. We were told that there were weapons inside the house, uh, a great amount of cocaine, and a number of children. One of my jobs or responsibilities when we went into the house was to isolate the children from the, a lot of the other commotion that was going on related to a raid. On one particular evening when we went into this house, after all the commotion, we went to this, uh, got into the house and it was secured. We went to this door that was closed in this bedroom and several police gathered around it. And outside the door we saw this sign that read, read the damn sign. No drinks or pipes in my room, just stay out, my room. And we opened the door very carefully, and when we saw in the corner of the room an 11-year-old girl who was hiding in the corner for fear of all the commotion that was going on around her. Around the room were anti-drug posters produced by our coalition, a workbook of drug refusal skills given to her by her teacher, and several other messages aimed at reducing substance abuse. I might add, all were resources produced with funding from safe and drug-free school money. That night, we took the house, out of the house, nine handguns, over $30,000 in crack cocaine, and the pipes that she was referring to on the sign were crack pipes. In the midst of the confusion and craziness, this 11-year-old child was making a stand. Around her were the tools of support that provided her information and a mechanism for venting her own outrage with the behavior of parents and siblings. I fear that in the midst of the current vacuum of national leadership and the threat of rescissions and cuts in significant national programs aimed at addressing this issue, this young woman and thousands like her will not have a place to stand. They look to our president, they look to you and to me and other members of this panel for assurances that this will not happen. CADCOM members have been more than a little frustrated with the failure of our nation's leadership to keep the pervasiveness of drug abuse before the American people. Alarming increases in marijuana, cocaine, and heroin when use, as indicated in the Pride in Monitoring the Future survey data, suggests that our messages are of the dangers associated with drug abuse are getting lost in the clutter of other messages such as legalization, how funds arrive in local communities, and whether or not the president inhaled or didn't inhale, or the speaker smoked low-grade or high-grade marijuana in graduate school. All of this is perceived by our members as mindless 
conversation and has politicized and poisoned our national conversation on the drug problem. There is a growing fear among CADCA members that any national drug strategy that is only words on paper and visions vanishing in clouds of hopelessness. All of us today are faced with this disturbing dilemma. As Gerald Seib recently pointed out in the Wall Street Journal, now comes the new Republican Congress, which will be torn between its budget-cutting impulses and the painful fact that programs to interdict drugs and prevent their cost, co use cost money. Saib further pointed out that some in the drug fighting community are particularly worried that if spending on federal social programs get packed into block grants and shipped out to the states, drug fighting will get pushed to the back of the line of competing cl claims. Close quote. Yours is not an easy task, and devastation caused by our nation's neighborhoods uh, or caused by our nation's drug abuse problems continues to bring havoc and chaos among many of our nation's youth and neighborhoods. My members see it daily, and the story of this young child is only one story, but it is a story that should speak to the nation. The subtitle of the National Drug Control Strategy released in February 1995 is Strengthening Communities' Response to Drugs and Crime. Dr. Brown and his staff are to be committed for advancing a strategy that includes community prevention, along with traditional law enforcement, treatment, and interdiction responses to this growing crisis. A strategy, however, is only as good as the resources that follow it and the visible leadership that advances it. We still seek greater parity between supply-side issues and demand reduction issues. We still maintain that there must be a national voice advocating for substance abuse prevention, and that voice should be loudest from the White House and the Congress. We still maintain that there is a direct correlation between perceived risk of crime and drug abuse with resources that are allocated to fight these twin evils. It is our dream that eventually we will see a strategy embraced by both the administration and Congress that supports a national drug abuse prevention system that coordinates, consolidates, and leads all substance abuse prevention activities within this country. If there was such a system, or even an agency, we could reduce federal duplication, maximize funding strategies, promote common messages, establish a national dissemination network, and assure our local communities that substance abuse prevention is vital both to our planning and to our future. If we establish such an authority or administration, we could save millions of dollars if in federal resources directed toward preventing drugs. We, use, we urge you to heed calls within the current strategy and from this Congress itself to coordinate, to think strategically about limited resources, and to understand the importance of a national message that is supported by national resources. Finally, this is not an issue about Republicans and Democrats. It is not about block grants and national dissemination grants. It is about giving our children a place to stand as they refuse the horror of drug abuse. It is giving them a place to stand in the face of poverty, it is a place to stand in despair, fractured and broken families. It is giving them hope. Our members are prepared and are willing to work with whatever resources are provided. But you must know that prevention in this country has always been seriously and drastically underfunded. You cannot expect local communities to compete among limited resources. Do we buy police cars or do we produce another workbook to place within our schools? What is the answer? The answer is probably both. You cannot ignore the data. You cannot hide from the haunting image of another child seduced by the message that casual use is acceptable or the pain in the face of a family who has buried their child because of an overdose of heroin. We urge you to embrace a national strategy that is comprehensive, balanced, and directs the majority of the resources to local communities to address local problems. Peter Drucker, in the February issue of the Atlantic Monthly, has argued that as government seeks to reinvent itself, there must be preserved for the federal government the role of engaging in national crusades. Drucker points to the drug war as one such crusade. This crusade is about saving lives. It is about giving a firm foundation so that our children can make their stand. It is time that we as a nation make this crusade our national priority, and in the process, perhaps we will reinvent national will and character. Thank you. Mr. Hurd.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. My name is Bobby Hurd, and I'm the Director of Program Services for the Texans War on Drugs, a statewide grassroots nonprofit organization dedicated to prevention and mobilizing individuals and community to ad communities to address one of the most serious problems facing my state and our country, substance abuse. It's certainly an honor to be part of this hearing with such distinguished individuals, and especially our former First Lady. Mrs. Reagan may not know this, but it was primarily because of her focus and attention to the problem when she was in the White House that I, I became involved in this cause as a sophomore in high school. I remember reading in the paper the story she actually told this morning about the visit that she made to Oakland. I was, uh, and how inspired those young children were by her visit and made the pledge to her to lead a drug-free life and formed a club to help others do the same. I remember thinking that if a group of fifth graders in Oakland could take a, a stand and educate their peers, maybe so could we. Um, in my high school, we formed a group just doing that. And soon I came face to face with the reality of how young young people were getting involved with drugs. It's sad that most parents, community leaders, and elected officials don't realize how easy it is for kids to get involved with drugs. No young person, every adult needs to know how important it is that young people get clear and consistent messages from their communities, peers, and adults that drugs will not be tolerated and drugs are wrong and harmful. In today's society, the norm is for many young people to try drugs. When our culture and media are fostering blatant pro-drug me pro messages, it's no wonder our youth find it hard to say no to drugs. Yes, I agree with what's been said here today. It really appears as if our country and elected leaders have lost the will for addressing this problem. What I don't understand is why. We know how to prevent this problem. And on that point, I'd like to set one thing straight. Prevention is not pork. Unfortunately, during the crime bill debate, all prevention was painted with a broad brush as being wasteful and ineffective, but that's wrong. We know how to prevent substance abuse, and we know substance abuse prevention works. It's because of substance abuse prevention that we were able to cut drug use in half, which you've seen these charts, between 1979 and 1992. No other social issue can claim that kind of success. But now, with no national will, no real leadership, a strong resurgence of pro-drug messages in the media, and reduced funding, and now even elimination of entire programs, it should be no surprise that drug use is on the rise. The only real solution we have is to reduce the demand for drugs. You can ask any law enforcement official, and they will tell you it's prevention that offers us the only real hope. Building prisons alone will not break the cycle. Medical experts will tell you we can't treat our way out of this problem. We have never been able to treat our way out of any epidemic this country has faced. Why do we think we can when it comes to drug abuse and addiction? Prevention must be something we do from generation to generation. Some of the proposals Congress are talking about is like saying last year we taught our first graders to read and they did quite well. So now we can take the money we use to teach reading and do something else. But what happens to the ones that will be in first grade next year? Three weeks ago, when I was here in Washington, D.C. with my organization's president to meet with members of our Texas congressional delegation, we saw almost every member from Texas. And we really appreciated the time they took to listen to our concerns. Most there understood the severity of this issue. However, what disappointed me was that a number of them felt no urgency in addressing this problem. And even one freshman congressman said, the federal government has no role to play in the war on drugs, that this is a problem for state and local governments. Without any disrespect, he was wrong. The federal government has a critical role to play. We must have national leadership. As we proved in the 1980s with national focus and attention to this problem, we can make a tremendous difference in reducing the demand. At a time when we desperately need to turn up the volume against drug use, this Congress and the administration seems intent on not only turning down the dial, but eliminating the station altogether. Basically, it appears that the Congress is trying to dismantle our entire prevention structure. Last week, the House Appropriations Committee voted to send a rescission package to the floor of the House of Representatives now scheduled for a vote on March 15th. The bill eliminates previously authorized funds for the Safe and Drug-Free Schools and Communities Act. I understand from our Texas members of that subcommittee that the main reason the program was eliminated, one of the main reasons, was to find money to pay for disaster relief in California. They're eliminating one of the most important programs that reaches almost every school child from grades K through 12 in America, works to strengthen the family and community by building healthy drug-free youth while trying to pay for one state's natural disaster, we are, cheat we are creating the potential for serious national and human disaster affecting every family in all 50 states. 
Another proposal that alarms me is uh, a large youth development block grant proposed by Congressman Goodling and Senator Kasselbaum. Basically, they want to take all the federal prevention dollars allocated for substance abuse prevention along with several other programs and send that money to the county level to be administered by local officials. The money would be dispersed by local youth development advisory boards and used for any type of general youth development. In their proposal, the makeup of the boards does not include any substance abuse prevention specialists. We are talking about taking money now designated for drug education, giving it to local counties to spend on any type of general youth development. Now that should be a good debate on pork. Equally disheartening was to see in the President's budget a proposal to consolidate the demonstrations and programs for the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention and the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment under SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration. Prevention and treatment are two very different approaches to dealing with the drug problem. Treatment tackles the problem on the back end while prevention is stopping something before it ever starts. When I talk about national leadership, part of that has been the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention. It's been a beacon for grassroots community and prevention programs. Through CSAP's demonstration grants, we've gained a wealth of research that shows us what works and what does not. Consolidation would only pr pit pr treatment against prevention with each fighting for very scarce resources. In this time of consolidation and cost savings, what might make sense is to consolidate all federal substance abuse prevention programs under one agency or create a separate drug abuse specific prevention block grant that could send monies to the states. Short recess uh, for less than 10 minutes. I think most, as soon as we have two members come back, we'll reopen. Um, and I have to go to vote, so we'll be right back, okay? We're now in recess. Even done. Mm. What are you going to do? I don't know. Better. Uh -huh. That's right. Committee will reconvene. I think due to the lateness of the hour and meetings that other apparently people have, um, we're going to limit the questioning to just uh, if, if you have anything burning that you'd like. Uh, I do. You do. <laughs> there you go. My partner from the other side has a burning issue. It's, it's not burning, but I, but I really need to ask Todd something and, and since since, Todd, we're talking about the rise of drug use within our youth, um, and you obviously are actively involved in this partnership, at your school, what kind of peer pressure is put on? Or, or is it just kind of casual and people just kind of hang out? And I mean, can you kind of give us an insight because there's kind of two groups. There's a whole group of people who use drugs and a group of people who don't, and usually they don't interchange. So I think it's more, it's more social than, um, if you're in a group, then you already use drugs or you don't. So it's usually stick with that. And uh, I think it's much more casual rather than, um, by the time kids get into high school, they usually know how to deal with peer pressure. Either, either they're gonna get, give into it or they're gonna resist it. I mean, the determining factor is middle school, not really high school. I taught middle school for nine years. I <laughs> tend to agree with you. Yeah. And I have a 16 and a 17 year old, so I, I can appreciate that. Let me just ask one very quick question as well. Because of your participation, um, and, and my guess is that your friends, or maybe not your friends, but children that you go to school with, mm -hmm. know about this. Um, do they give you a hard time? If I was in the local paper, yes. That's why I asked not to be. Um, yeah, they would be give me a hard time. And people who don't know me would end up hating me. So that's why I asked to be uh, exempt from the news, newspapers. So it is tough for you. But I had well, to do I, it for myself so, and for the issue. Well, I give you a lot of credit for that. Actually, I give all of you um, credit, and I wished we had more time to ask questions. Um, at this time, Mr. Chairman, however, I have been asked to uh, put into the record um, a letter to Ms. Meek, um, 
um, from uh, student and or I guess parents in Dade County School public system that actually reiterate basically what I've heard today from this panel about the uh, safe and drug-free schools as as to the difference it made in their lives. Without objection, so ordered. And secondly, since we're doing tapes, and I really wished we could have seen this, I'd also like to put in the partnership PSA that President Clinton has done also as a part of our um, record. Without, without objection, so ordered. Thank you, and I thank all of you for being here, and keep up the good work. We need people like you. The other statement that I would say to you is, I do believe that we as leaders and those people within our communities, that we need to build up what the good things that we're doing out there and not always talk about the bad, because when we talk about the bad, it gets a lot more publicity, and I think there's a lot more good out there than there is bad, and I think that is part of our responsibility. Thank you. I'd like you. to follow up one quick question. You heard a lot of testimony today, and um, we're trying to meet the challenge of refocusing the drug war. What single recommendation do you have for us as you've listened to this testimony? Um, well, I think it definitely has to start here, and people have to know that it's being made an issue here, such as George Bush made address the country on it last when he, was, when he had his term. I think President Clinton definitely has to do the same in order to really make it an issue, because every single kid in my town knew about that speech that George Bush gave. And they definitely took that into account when they decided um, on drugs. And I think that the um, primary thing is education in elementary schools and middle schools, because kids are still influenced and they're still going to listen to adults. Once t by the time they get into high school, it's not, you can't really turn back. And I think what I'm hearing you say that, that we need to lead by example whether it's the President of the United States or members of Congress or community leaders, your dad, your mom, uh, your relatives, you, you, really important. I mean, if you are given a good example and all of us provide that example, then it works its way all the way through. And then we get the message that drugs are no longer acceptable. And, exactly. And, and that's really what the goal is, isn't it? Um, I would just like to, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Hurd a question. You know, you mentioned youth development program, and we've heard a lot of programs in the community. And there are so many different agencies and so many different, you know, limited resources around. Um, how best, when it comes to prevention programs, how do we, in, in your working with it, how do we hold programs accountable, um, and so that we can tie in and know for sure get a, you know, if we have a good return on our investment, whether the funds should be still committed to that particular program or not? Well, I think that you need to require prevention programs, treatment programs, whatever, to have a, a very serious evaluative component. You know, one of the, I think, reasons the Drug-Free Schools program has come under criticism, particularly from Governor Engler, is that program doesn't require a, a, an evaluative component. Or, or if it does, only there, by law and the legislation, only 3% of those funds can be used for evaluation. Well, with 3% of your money, you can't really scientifically figure out very well if what you're doing is working or not doing. I mean, you look at what we're, what's happening with the CSAP, the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention, and their demonstration projects. and the money that they put into finding what's working and what's not working. Um, it's really sad that we potentially could be losing a program like uh, the Safe and Drug-Free Schools program because of one or two states. Governors can't get control of that money and have influenced this Congress. Whereas in my state, the money is working very well in Texas. And in my state, uh, we have data to show uh, increased in, uh, uh, in um, or less violence in the school, less dropout rate. I mean, there are some direct correlations that we've been able to find as a result of that, but we've put a little money into evaluation, and we need to, we need to require all states uh, to be doing that, and particularly with that, uh, that program. I think that would give a little safeguards there to prove that, that that's working. Good. Thank you. This concludes the first in a series of hearings that we will have uh, relative to drug program in America. And the problem uh, in the programs that we need to come up to deal with it, the accountability, uh, come up with leading by example, getting a focus from the White House on down, all of our roles as well are very vital to the, to the future of our country. Frankly, we have 
a, a, a tremendous opportunity before us. And today, I think, will provide a good opportunity to, to refor refocus the message and try to, to get back into the drug campaign to, to put uh, America back on track. And uh, I believe that, that we've done some good uh, just with what we've done here. And I believe that we will be meeting with Dr. Brown um, within the next 30 days, we'll have that classified briefing that he talked about. We'll have another hearing, and we'll do everything we can uh, from our end of it to, to somehow uh, make this a success. We thank you all very much for your participation. This week on American the Courts, fiscal year 96 appropriations for the U.S. Supreme Court. You'll see this week's testimony by Justices Anthony Kennedy and David Souter before a House Appropriations Subcommittee. American the Courts, Saturday at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 Pacific Time, on our companion network, C-SPAN. And later, the House Rules Committee meets to hear testimony on legislation concerning term limits. That bill, which would limit terms for members of Congress, will be considered.